First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. Oh, thanks for the warning. Now. Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage. Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? It's actually W-A-R-K, 
But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of t-shirt and socks and so on. Plus any medication you may need. And a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <laughs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe journey and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion, or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step, the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, -A -A an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name, since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second, yet to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true. Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? 
How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star. Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous, and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far as it has done already? Well, I must say your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question: Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal. While he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we weren't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library's sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion. You have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Okay. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively. You would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame, as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing. I felt that the two of you were a little too over rehearsed, so the presentation felt at times a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here. I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction. Well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your twenty-minute time slot that, sadly, you ran out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction, and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. 
You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department, and unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh my goodness, everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We worked so hard. No, no, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. Sports usually take a variety of forms. Organized competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favorite team to victory. Athletic games, played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found. And hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal so that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, people often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favorite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case, Surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports, drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation and with audiences who pay admission to watch. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.